And so our final talk then of this morning research session is from uh, Ziwa Wu. She's in the uh, Burge Robotics Lab in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, and she's going to be talking about challenges in dynamic mode decomposition. Ziwa. So hi everyone, are you guys um, hearing me and seeing the screen okay? I can hear you and see you. Thank you. And thanks for the introduction and all the amazing presentations before. I'm from Electrical and Computer Engineering Department, Robotics Institute, and I'm working in Bio-Inspired Robotics Dynamical System Lab, Bird Lab in short, but we don't work on um, birds, we're mainly studying animal locomotion, especially multi-legged animals like uh, cockroaches, ants, and crabs. We're also interested in adapt these principles we've learned from animals to construct and control robots. So data science can serve as a powerful tool in bridging animal behavior and the robot control and modeling. We use data-driven techniques to characterize like the locomotion via observation data taken from animals or robots. So we have many successful discoveries in our lab using data-driven techniques, but today I will show a failure case in modeling robot locomotion and our analysis on why this fails. So it comes my presentation challenges in dynamic mode decomposition. And uh, this work is done together with my advisor, Dr. Shai Rabdin and our collaborator, Dr. Steve Brunton. So my presentation will contain a brief introduction to dynamic mode decomposition, DMD in short, and its success in fluid dynamics. And when we are trying to adapt this method into modeling local motion, we encounter some serious issues. So therefore, we come up with a self-contained framework on analyzing how noise and nonlinearity will affect DMD results on spectrum estimation. Finally, we give generalizable data set properties for better DMD analysis and the remaining challenges for this powerful tool to untackle. So DMD is an emerging data-driven technique to obtain linear reduced other models for high dimensional complex system. We can extract this from data for a spatial temporal coherent structure or the patterns that uh, dominate the observed data measurement from dynamical system. This was first introduced into fluid community and have great success there and later connected to a nonlinear dynamical system theory called Cookman theory. But since then, the uh, DMD has been applied to a broad range of system like disease modeling, neuroscience, plasma, et cetera. So, why it is very applicable is because it's a purely data-driven method. It doesn't require any knowledge of the underlying equation of motion. It can work anytime you have data. You kind of plug data into DMD and turn the crank, and then you get out of the spatial temporal mode and a linear dynamical system for how they can evolve in time. In this example here, Suppose we're having a simulated flow plus a cylinder, and we are having this movie. Then we cut the movie into snapshots x1, x2, x3, evolving in time, and we fit these data into column vectors into this big x and x prime matrices. These columns x1, x2, etc., are evolving forward in time and x prime is one step forward on x. And what dynamic mode decomposition does, it tries to find the best linear fit A matrix for to advance x into x prime. 
And remember, we're having x1, x2 column vectors as the snapshot from the video, so it's probably a million entries on each column. And then the A matrix will have a trading by a trading elements inside. So we definitely don't want to directly compute what A matrix is. So in DMD, it will compute the leading terms of the eigenvalues and eigenvectors in A matrix without actually compute itself. This is done by doing the singular value decomposition on our big data X and X prime matrices. So DMD is, is extremely useful in doing diagnostics. For example, in this case, we're having the characteristic vortex flow field to characterize the physics of this dynamical system. And it's also useful for doing further a future state prediction as we're having this A matrix. And much of the interest surrounding DMD is due to its strong connection to nonlinear dynamical systems through Kupman spectrum theory. The Kupman operator was introduced in 1913 by Kupman. It's an infinitely dimensional linear operator that describes how measurements of a dynamical system evolve through the nonlinear dynamics. Because the measurements are functions, they form a Hilbert space. So the Kupman operator A here is an infinite dimensional operator. It essentially trades the um, nonlinear finite dimensional dynamics with a linear but infinite dimensional dynamics by embedding the nonlinearity into the measurement function, function G. In 2009, Raleigh demonstrated that under certain conditions, DMD can be used as a approximation for that infinite dimensional operator. <clears throat> So as we've seen so much success in dynamic mode decomposition analysis, we'd like to try it back in our own work. In our lab, we're working on developing data-driven models on multi-legged robot data from motion capture system. So these reflective dots you're seeing on our robot are how we are getting the trajectory of the robot from a motion capture system in our lab. And these lagged systems are oscillatory systems with slow transients. These modes decay only faster, slightly faster than a period. But our previous DMD analysis on this robot didn't give us a great result that we expected. It only gives us the slowest decaying mode and the mode that governing the period of the gate. But you will soon see in this video that the robot is having a very springy leg and it's well, the movement is very floppy. So there is definitely a slow transient mode, which is a mode can survive a couple of periods. As you will see in this video, so see the legs are very floppy and spinning on the ground and there is a mode and so why for a couple of periods. Therefore, we want to investigate the, po uh, the possible sources for the difficulties we've encountered in modeling local motion by studying a special case of class of systems, which both the latent linearization and the linearizing observables are completely known. So this is a self-contained stable linear system. And the, the latent state X are evolving with respect to A matrix and the observables are multinomial observables Y 
by some poly multinomial p function. And since we are modeling the physics physical system, we assume the system have both system noise and measurement noise. The test bed system I will present today is a, a stable real linear system with great dimensional states and considered specifically the case of a spectrum that contain a complex conjugate pair and a single real eigenvalue. Such system has two invariant subspace. One is the two-dimensional subspace that are generated by the complex conjugate pair eigenvalue, and another one is the one-dimensional subspace by the real eigenvalue. And for the um, two-dimensional subspace, the trajectory projected on that subspace have a spiral kind of behavior. And the, the spiral might not be a circular spiral. We can squeeze the, it to into a different ellipsoidal shape by changing this parameter S that I will introduce shortly. Um, so we construct the A matrix by using the eigenvector matrix Q. The theta and phi here is changing the angle so on here. And the S matrix is a diagonal S and an identity two by two matrix by squeezing the shape of the ellipse. And the lambda matrix is the spectrum matrix given the eigenvalues. And our numerical experiment used the three dimensional system with Gaussian system noise and Gaussian measurement noise, both set to zero mean and a standard deviation of 0.05. The initial conditions were chosen uniformly distributed on unit sphere. So the modern arc figures you're seeing here are just the contour plots showing the distribution of eigenvalue estimates. We use a smooth Gaussian kernel to make the plot look good. The red crosses shown on each figure are the ground truth eigenvalues. And the results here are all about the same spectrum and using the same amount of data, 100 data points, but different row of the plot are having different trajectory lengths. So say for the first row, we're having two trajectories with each length 50. And second row, we're having 10 trajectories with each trajectory length 10. And the last row is having 50 trajectories with each trajectory length 2. And different uh, columns are having different parameter theta that used in previous eigenvector matrix that perturbing the angle between real invariant subspace with the two-dimensional complex conjugate pair subspace. And thus it changed the condition number of system A matrix. So we're having the first column A matrix condition number two, second column condition number 20, and the third column condition number three, uh, 30,000. And the difference between the left hand side subplot and the right hand side subplot is the left hand side is using a linear observable that's the same as the linear latent state, and the right hand side are using first and the second order monomials as observables. Note that for no for monomials, the observed system is an extended higher dimensional linear system whose eigenvalues are the combination of eigenvalues from the original system. So in our case, we're having nine dimensional linear system evolving in the observed space. So we're having nine eigenvalues plot shown on the right. And uh, we can see in the left, lower corner, these two plots 
Dean is doing a great job in estimating the eigenvalues. But as soon as we make a matrix slightly non-normal, as we're seeing on the right, the result can get very profound. And the structure of the error, even in linear case, can get very complicated. Like in this case, we're getting a kind of bimodal di distribution on the eigenvalue estimation. And we also study for different spectrums. All these settings for these plots are the same as before, but the eigenspace of the system is unperturbed. So the um, eigenspace, uh, the eigenvectors are all orthogonal to each other. The difference here is we're moving this right cross the real eigenvalue outward for different columns. And uh, as you can see, the estimation for the last row looks great. As we're having less initial conditions and more trajectories, the result is getting worse. So the reason for this is probably that the longer trajectory will finally fall into the noise contour. And the, at the end of those trajectories, the data we have is basically governed by noise. So it's harder to extract the useful information from that dynamical system. So there are some general takeaway that we have for people who want to perform dynamic mode decomposition on their data sets. As we're plotting here are some more general different spectrum versus the standard deviation of eigenvalue estimates. So the general takeaway is for well posted data, more initial conditions can significantly increase the data efficiency as we're seeing for dense equals to two, it's uniformly performed better than all the other like longer trajectory, less initial conditions. And we also do the same plot with respect to different condition members. Um, this plot is harder to and harder to analyze analyze than previous plot but uh, what we can see here the circles are kind of better than and the other trajectory setting so we gave the suggestion for slightly ill conditioned data a moderate trajectory length is needed to reconstruct the spectrum and in the end as we've seen before, the nonlinearity introduced in this project is only a second order monomial observable. So it's very mildly nonlinear conditions, but it caused a very large eigenvalue estimation error. And the perturbation we gave to the eigenspace is just making the system matrix slightly ill conditioned, but it's also caused complicated multi modal error structure. So these are the remaining challenges for dynamic mode decomposition to untackle in the future. And that's all for my presentation. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Yuwa. Very interesting talk. And I hope you'll be around for the networking session where we'll be able to uh, address any of your questions. I'd like to pass the mic back to Jing who will uh, tell us about the next session and perhaps the rest of the afternoon. All right. Thanks, everyone, for the wonderful talks. And thanks, Chris. I just want to uh, remind everybody this afternoon's schedule. Let me try to share my screen again. Yeah. OK, so the challenge this afternoon is that we are not together. We will be going to a networking session and then uh, a break, then poster session, um, so, and mini workshops. So I want to be sure that everybody knows that you can find all the login information on our website, in the email that we sent you. Also, if you get lost, just email Midas-contact. Okay, so, 
I especially want to be sure that we all remember the six mini workshops that will happen this afternoon, uh, led by six groups of faculty, staff, and graduate students. So um, I hope to see everyone at one of these six rooms. At the networking session, um, the link of which will show up, show up in, in chat momentarily, as well as on our website and in email. Um, you will be able to meet with the speakers this, this morning. You'll be able to meet uh, with other attendees with the Midas team, and also our, many of our sponsors will be there as well. All right, so with this, I'd like to conclude this session and welcome everyone to our networking room. We'll see you there. <laughs>